Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Aloha. Welcome to What's on Your Mind Hawaii. I'm Tim Apicella. Hawaii's main economic driver is still tourism. For 2018, tourist arrivals continue to visit our shores in increasing numbers. To date, it stands at 6% increase from 2017. Last year, 9.3 million visitors came to our state. What would happen if those numbers would start to fall? What factors could contribute to the reversal of robust tourist visits? In a word, crime. A rash of crime events have made their way onto the pages of the Star Advertiser in the last many weeks. Specifically, articles of a Japanese tourist seriously beaten in the face in Kaka'ako, a purse snatching, a female tourist punched in the face at Kohio Beach, a female tacked and slashed with a box cutter in front of Long's on Kawakawa. What did these events have in common? They all occurred in the midday, in broad daylight. Nighttime can be worse. A murder of a 23-year-old Marine, William Brown, visiting from New York, a 20-year-old female beaten, raped, and burned outside a Waikiki nightclub. For decades, locals and some returning tourists know that after midnight, it's best to watch where you go in Waikiki. The Visitor Aloha Society of Hawaii helped 1,640 victims of crime in 2017. In January of this year, the Department of Defense issued a list of several establishments in Waikiki that soldiers and sailors were not allowed to enter. That list was published in the Star Advertiser. That list was deemed bad for business, bad for profits. Is a police presence enough in Waikiki? Is there enough presence in the daytime? If more news stories about brutal assaults or murders persist, how long will it take before tourists take note and maybe fly somewhere else? Our interview with a local resident explores the lack of awareness tourists may have when they come to Hawaii and other aspects of crime in Waikiki. We'll also follow up with a dog owner to discuss the recently passed law, Senate Bill 2416, in the last legislative session. This law prohibits any attempts to pass off a pet as a real service animal. With fines from $100 to $500, this new law may be prompting a few pet owners to take note. And now, those interviews. Aloha, this is Tim Apicello for What's On Your Mind Hawaii for Think Tech Hawaii. I'm here today with speaking with Jeffrey. We're down here at the beaches of Waikiki. And the topic of the day is some recent reports in the news regarding uh, some crime, midday crime, here in the Waikiki area. Jeffrey, thank you very much for uh, agreeing to be on our show. Of course, thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, so, Jeffrey, um, we were talking before this interview yes. about some r recent ex news stories that have come into the paper, and it's not just crime that's after midnight, but in some cases, this is crime that's occurring here in Waikiki in the midday. Have you uh, read about those stories at all? Uh, not as of recently. Uh, you know, I've been here for a couple years now, and it's usually reports at night you know it's it's that after dark it's you know nothing happens good after 12 o'clock at night which my dad always told me um, however it's concerning more now than ever that it's that's happening during the day um, as a, a resident here in local um, it's disheartening to hear that you know people come here to have have that time to have that Hawaiian experience to have that Aloha you know that world famous for um, to have midday you know beatings and or thefts uh, it's it's very concerning for everyone. It should be concerning to the state, to the uh, to immigrant, uh, people at home. You know, everyone, especially down here at the beach. We well, are associated with the tourist industry, so you know how easily tourism could be affected by bad news stories. And before this interview, we were talking about your time in the Cayman Islands and, and other places of you know where the tourists like to go. And so, to what degree do you think a news story could actually dampen or or actually hurt tourism? Uh, you know, some people say that, uh, you know, all good, all news is good news, but it's, it's not. Um, I've seen it happen on the cruise lines uh, in Cayman. I've seen it happen in Mexico recently uh, with Tulum and Cancun. Um, that has deterred uh, foreigners from coming there, you know, and having a million, you know, millions of dollars, millions and millions and millions of dollars that is revenueing this state. Uh, it's very, very concerning. You know, it's a, it's not only that it should be reported on, but it's more of, you know, what are, what are we doing to solve it? You know, that's the big issue. Like, how how can we, uh, how can my, me myself, how can we get this solved? You know, how is how, what is the state doing? What is you know the police doing? Is there more an increase in uh, patrolling in the area? That kind of certain thing. Well, that's a good point because 
I mean, we know that tourism is the largest industry we have. And we know that we'd love to have other industries that kind of diversify our economy, but tourism is it still. So the question is, to what degree is the state, the city county of Honolulu, trying to address these midday crimes that does not affect our basically the most important industry we have, not only in Oahu, but the entire state? Uh, making it more aware to the local population so then it does spread you know with social media how it is right now with Facebook Instagram that kind of thing using platforms like that to tell people that it is still Aloha you know we are doing the best to, of our ability you know as the state of Hawaii run and to to nip this in the butt to you know we're going out there at extra lengths and measures to make sure everyone's safe and having a good time I guess part of the irony, I, irony is that we had a midday assault right at Kohio Beach, yet the Honolulu Police Station is stationed at Kohio Beach. And then, of course, I did a show earlier about this, the shade pavilions and yeah. all the crime and alleged drug activity that's going on under the shade pavilions. And there's a bill proposed by uh, Trevor Azawa, a council member, the, to pull those shade, the shades out of there. Yeah. So that will expose the sun and there won't be this haven, alleged haven for drug usage. I guess the question is, is that really the solution or you suggested more, more activity, more, vi more visibility of the police department uh, here on the streets of Waikiki? Yeah, it, you know, more good news. You know, there's no, there's no point being negative about, and, you know, but it is, it's important to tell the public what's going on, but it's more important to tell them what we're doing about it. Um, that's the most important thing to me, knowing they, that, you know, there are more police officers uh, vigilantly going around town and cracking down on, you know, maybe not the homeless, but the troublemakers in the bunch. You know, uh, I don't want to say stand here and tell you that, you know, we, there is a homeless problem here, but it's in, there's a lot of circumstantial reasoning why they are homeless. Not to say that, you know, everyone's had a bad year or something like that, you know, get them on their feet. But, you know, the, there are ones in the crowd there that are the issue are the problem because they'll go at great lengths to feed the addiction well to mayor caldwell's credit he did initiate a sit and lie ban here in the waikiki area and then he's expanded those zones and you know that has helped as far as the sidewalks and people panhandling on the sidewalks and things like that that actually i think was a good thing to make sure our, our tourism continues on the way it has and it has i mean our tourism is growing the question is, does a sit and lie bill actually stop crime? And I, I would say probably not. I mean, it's not like it drove people away from the Waikiki zone. It just says you can't sit and you can't lie. Um, any thoughts about that? You know, the weather here and because of where people live, where we live here, uh, it makes it easier. Um, I was telling you before, uh, St. Thomas has similar uh, characteristics to Hawaii where you can take that one-way ticket here to paradise and you don't have to leave. Um, the example was I was in Maui and I landed and the two gentlemen were getting off the plane and I asked them, you know, what were you guys up to? Where are you headed? And, you know, they, ha they had two backpacks and had no clue, um, which is glorious in some ways, but then you just hope that they don't end up in the sit and lie situation where then they are attracting uh, and they're panhandling and they're uh, disrupting the beauty and culture of Hawaii. Well, that's a good point, and it, it actually points uh, in a direction of what is the average awareness of the average tourist that comes to Hawaii, Waikiki, or wherever, no matter what island, to what degree are they informed about some of the cultural issues that they should be attentive to, but also what are some of the, um, you know, the current events of the day? Are they attuned to what going on with crime or or things of that nature. And I think that's usually a problem, that people aren't usually tuned into that because they're so busy trying to get ready for the trip that they're not really paying attention to those sort of details. Well, you'd have to look look far and long to or wide to not know someone who's seen a postcard of this beach behind us here, you know? Um, and that's that. That's what brings people here, you know, that, that aloha spirit and, and these beaches, you know, not only in Oahu here, but, you know, Maui and Kauai, all that. And I think that people are, over, they overlook some issues, um, which may help the industry here. Uh, you know, if, if people were more aware of it, maybe it would deter them from coming. But it's not about the deterrence, it's about 
progress moving forward. You know, that forward movement of, no, we're, we, there is less panhandling than 10 years ago, which I was here 10 years ago. I would, I, I, it's hard for me to say. I don't think there is. I think it's about the same. I don't think, you know, if you walk down Waikiki Strip here, um, there's acts going on. There's, it's a busy, busy area. And it, again, it's, I can't imagine the law enforcement and the, uh, their ability, what they're doing is great. It has to be the most difficult thing in the world. You know, I, I, would know, I have no idea what clue to uh, how to deter that. Um, but just this, knowing the steps involved and that they are making jumps and leaps and bounds uh, towards a, a bigger and better Hawaii would be great. Well, we all know that crime statistics ebbs and flows. It's up, there's down. Statistics are just that, they're statistics. And there's averages, there's median, you know, mead statistics. Um, so we may be at a period where right now, maybe the media is just picking up something that's always been occurring and it's just being picked up on and being put on the front page more and more, uh, more and more than, than normally. Um, that could also be what's going on here. So before this interview also, we were talking about, you know, some of the, the, the causes of, of crime, particularly in tourist zone areas. And you had mentioned that, you know, perhaps we have some issues relating to drugs and addiction. You think that's, that's part of this? Very much so. Um, I would say when you have a, a small area with bars and restaurants in that, that vibe that Waikiki in Honolulu gives off, um, you have that late night uh, party goers, you have those people on vacation wanting to take and have, maybe have that extra drink, maybe have those extra five drinks. Uh, that then causes, it, it causes a disruptance and it causes, uh, you know, things behind the scenes to happen. Um, you know, the, the bad, you know, the stuff after 12 o'clock that you maybe not, you don't want to see out. Um, and that's, and that's what people thrive on. And, and, uh, you know, to sit here and say that, you know, you can, directly affect that and make that all go away it's not um but i think that when you have high tourist density density in a, in a small area um you do have a pickup in nightlife and uh there's just a lot there's a lot going on um and, and not all of it's good not that you're a law enforcement uh consultant <laughs> um but from your observations of being here for many many years and you've been other other islands you know internationally yep. Do you think there's a common solution or um, perhaps something that can alleviate some of the uh, tourist crime that occurs here? It's all about deterrence. Uh, you know, you want to make a stand that, you know, it won't be allowed. Uh, that's, that's the biggest thing. You know, if people are scared to do something, they're more inclined not to do it. Uh, if they're not scared, if they think they can walk nilly, nilly around here and uh, hit up people for you know, spare change or rob during, you know, during daylight hours on a beach, uh, that's when you have serious problems. And that, and that stems, you know, further and, and deeper than, than most, you know, uh, yeah. Well, in my mind, part of it also is a, a proactive education of tourists. Even before they, they set foot in the airport, they land at the airport, is maybe there's an ability or opportunity to say, well, by the way, and not only just with crime, but also just water safety. I know that um, Hawaiian Airlines are now actually having some proactive statements in their, their video yeah. before the airplane lands about water safety. Yeah. Um, hiking, how, you get a lot of hiking accidents. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that tourisms don't realize that the law of physics don't apply when they're on vacation, but sometimes it seems that way. Yeah. I mean, it's one thing to uh, experience a wave in the middle of a big lake that you, are, you, know, that you live next to versus a, a big wave from the ocean with a surge and the power of that wave. So. To what degree do you think um, the state or the city and county of Honolulu should try to take proactive measures to try to educate tourists um, rather than have a reactive response to something uh, that could either be tragic or, you know, a misfortune? You know, that's a great point. And I think that uh, using Instagram and Facebook and all these social media apps, maybe if they can get that word out that you're saying um, that you know, water safety is a priority. Uh, policing is a priority here. Uh, using those apps and that media that's essentially free and that people are using more now than ever before uh, can help. I think that I think that it would it would go a long way, especially with some you know posts uh, you know about Hawaii and uh, you know about the culture and history, but the, then also the day to day stuff. You know, the current situation of 2018 Hawaii. Um, 
that's 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 important as well. So you mentioned the the social media. Um, that's a great idea, and maybe in conjunction with the hotel industries and the airline industries, everything that kind of intersects with tourism mm -hmm. and where tourists are getting their information about, even tours itself. I mean, you're you're in that industry, and um, to what degree would anyone get involved to try to educate something that isn't exactly positive, mm -hmm. but very important? You know, in, in the tourist industry, and I think uh, those listening and watching can tell you that if you asked me a place to go, I would tell you where to go, how to do it, and then exactly where not to go, you know? And, and that's a good and a bad thing, you know? Places, yeah. that, places that I wouldn't go, um, I, would I would tell them that. But I, I'm also a realist now, and, I, and I'm truthful to people as well. You know, there's no hiding um, that, that silver lining. You know, you, you don't want to, especially right. when it comes to safety. Uh, that could be water, you know, going out to Makapu or Sandy's, you know, hey, like, you know, just really be careful, watch yourself. Or, you know, out past 12 o'clock, 1 a.m., you know, on the streets of Honolulu downtown or here on Waikiki. Yeah. Um, well, I, there's that fine line between balance. I mean, I remember uh, the military actually publishing in the Star Advertiser enough, uh, a number of drinking establishments that were now off or a warning to to their, the military about places to avoid, and I won't mention any names right now, but they were they were published in in the newspaper, mm -hmm. and boy was that news story squashed very quickly after that because again, tourism is such an important economic driver to our state um, that that was kind of not a good news story, <laughs> but it was an important story, and yeah. uh, you know, and that and that warning list was actually a public service to those vet, you know those military personnel that are going to come into Waikiki, yeah. so. How, how do we gauge that balance? How do we, how do you think they, we try to balance information and, you know, helpful information versus trying to scare the, the uh, tourist and, and drive away the tourist? It's about being truthful um, in all sorts of the matter, you know, truthful in statistics. What are the current statistics of, and demographics of Waikiki, of Honolulu, of, of Oahu itself? Um, you know, statistics drive tourism it drives money it drives capital uh you know from every sense you know if you get those statistics out there to the people maybe they'll maybe they'll make uh, it'll be a deterrent and they'll make a better choice when they do come you know that's a good point because the police often say we can't combat crime if we don't know it's occurring and the only way we know it's occurring is because people need to report it it becomes a statistic and then we can then we can respond to that data so that's, that's a good point that you brought up so if you were, um, you know, if you were in front of city council and you had the whole council in chamber and, and, and you were at the microphone and the podium, what would you say to city council, to the mayor's office about maybe what can be done a little bit better here in our home, our community about, you know, these unfortunate stories are starting to take place about crime in Waikiki and this whole area? Uh, that's a great question. If I, if I was personally in front of the city council, um, you know, I would first just tell them that I'm I'm grateful to live here. I, I love the culture. I love the aloha. I love the spirit of Hawaii. You know, there's certain you know when you get off the plane here, you, there's something in the air um, that that's why that drives people here. You know, and uh, let's keep it that way. You know, I would say that there's nothing right now that's that's negative that they're doing that like, maybe say that they're not doing enough or this or that or I know the solution. That's not it because I don't. Um, but I would say that. Letting pe being keeping people informed is the route to having them come back. You know, hey, we're gonna make it better. You know, just like if you leave a hotel, how was your stay? Hope you had a great time. You know, mahalo, thank you for coming. You know, and then you you may want to come back. You know, I've been coming to Dukes here for more than ten years, uh, right in front of Waikiki, because this is this is the, this feels at home. It feels like a good place where I can I can sit here and have a, a beverage and uh, and relax. So. Um, to them, I would say, you know, thank you for everything and uh, just, just keep everyone informed. Well, if I was on the council and I heard that response, I'd uh, suggest you throw in your nomination for the next council position. So, Jeffrey, hey, Tim, thank you very much for uh, being on What's on Your Mind Hawaii. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. This is Tim Apicella for What's on Your Mind Hawaii for Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. All right. Well, that's our first interview. So we're going to take a commercial break and we'll be right back.
and aloha. My name is Calvin Griffin, the host of Hawaii in Uniform. And every Friday at 11 o'clock here on Think Tech Hawaii, we bring you the latest in what's happening within the military community. And we also invite all your response to things that's happening here. For those of you who haven't seen the program before, again, we invite your participation. We're here to give information, not disinformation. And we always enjoy response from the public. But join us here, Hawaii in Uniform, Fridays, 11 a.m., here on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. Hey, Stan the Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. And they won't let me do political commentary, so I'm stuck doing energy stuff. But I really like energy stuff, so I'm going to keep on doing it. So join me every Friday on Stan the Energy Man at lunchtime, at noon, on my lunch hour. We're going to talk about everything energy, especially if it begins with the word hydrogen. We're going to definitely be talking about it. We'll talk about how we can make Hawaii cleaner, how we can make the world a better place, just basically save the planet. Even Miss America can't even talk about stuff like that anymore. We got it nailed down here. So we'll see you on Friday at noon with Stan the Energy Man. Aloha. Welcome back for What's on Your Mind Hawaii, and now our second interview that's going to cover the issue of pet service law that was recently passed in the, this year's state legislature. And now that interview. Aloha. I'm Tim Apicello, the host for What's on Your Mind Hawaii for Think Tech Hawaii. Today I'm out here at Hawaii Kai, the dog park, and we're going to do a show follow-up from the law that was passed about the prohibition of animals in public areas, public Restaurant, restaurants and you know hardware stores and all that because of um, fake service dogs in the past fake animals so uh, I'm here with Dave and Dave you're here with Iggy and Fonz Fonzie yes. yeah and um, we were just talking before uh, we went on air here that uh, we have an you have an opinion about what you think about the new law and how it's been passed and what was behind it that made it pass so what do you think about the, the new law well, I, I, I think for um, the people that really need service dogs, it, you know, it's great, but I don't believe that if somebody's taking advantage of just getting uh, getting something for their service dog, and, and they're not a service dog, I don't agree on that. I hope it doesn't make it harder for people that really do need the, uh, the service dogs to get into public places. Now, when this law was passed, it was acknowledged that Probably 97% of the population will, will A, recognize it's a new law, and, and B, respect it. Uh, but there is that acknowledgement that 3%, even though they know it's a law, they're still going to bring their uh, animals in with a fake service vest that they buy for $19.99 online yeah. and still try to pass their dog off as a service animal. Um, what do you think about that? What's it say about our society? First off, doing it in the first place, but then doing it knowing that it's, you know, it's illegal. Yeah, I mean, you're going to get... That three percent, that that small percent that do that, I, I just hope it doesn't affect every other, every other dog owner or uh, pet owner that needs that. Um, that's just my opinion on, on that. You know. So have you ever? Oh, Fonzie, yeah. <laughs> uh, have you ever been? I won't edit this out, by the way. Um, have you ever been in a situation where you have been in a, a restaurant or a public, you know, in a public space where? someone brought their dog in and it was either with a fake service vest or not and the dog was a problem in, in, to the restaurant or whatever? No, 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 no. I've been into a lot of restaurants and I've been with uh, friends that have service dogs and the dogs are fine. Uh, there was no disturbance in the restaurant and they're, you know, perfect for, for that. I, I haven't seen anybody bring in a dog where you say, oh, that's not a service dog. So, you know? so most people that have the service dogs they're mindful and it's for a legitimate reason I, and i've traveled too and traveled in under, other countries and yeah. people with service dogs. you know i remember before the law before costco down the way here posted their sign service animals only yeah. and i remember costco having a lot of pets you know in the in the carts and you know on leash yeah. and, and they didn't necessarily have any uh, vests on and things like that do you remember that in those days yeah it was funny my wife tried to bring one in our, our, our puppy in and that was before we didn't see any signs and they said oh no it needs to be a service dog uh -huh. and so we had just got uh, our, our puppy and so we said okay then we yeah. just took the dog our dog out so 
you know, you go to Home Depot or, you know, or any of the other hardware stores, and same thing, they used to have a lot of dogs in there and a lot of pets, and have you noticed a difference at all? I've never seen pets in Home Depot or Lowe's or City Mills, so um, mainly in restaurants I've seen service dogs or, you know, at Costco every once in a while I'd I'd see that. Do you fly? Yeah. Do you see pets these days on on, on carriers? Oh, sure. Yeah, all the time. What kind of size of pets do you see? What kind of animals? Pretty big, pretty big size dogs, you know, um, you know, like 30, 40 pound dogs. Yeah. Really well behaved. Those probably are real service animals then. Yeah, I would think they are, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So do you think, um, now the airlines have been cracking down on this for the last several months now. Mm-hmm. Uh, United, Delta, they're all coming out with very strict policies about um, certifying that their animal is legitimate service animal before the flight, yeah. not at the time of the flight. Yeah. Uh, do you think it's appropriate? And what else measures do you think they should do or, or not do? Yeah, I think that would be appropriate, you know, to have, I guess, the, the basic paperwork you need to just before you fly. It's just like when you fly overseas, you've got to show your passport. So, you know, so, some sort of record that this is a service dog for whatever reason that you, you need it for. Yeah, I think that's a good, that's a good thing. You know, it did amaze me that Hawaii is one of the, actually one of the first and few states that's actually starting to implement these kind of laws. Mm-hmm. And, you know, sometimes we're kind of trailing the, the pack yeah, on certain laws. So do um, you think it's a good idea to, to implement nationwide as far as a concept? Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, just so everybody's on the same page, you don't want to say, well, in my state, we don't need to do this. Or in my state, we do it this way. I think it's kind of a general rule of thumb. Uh, a general guideline would be good, you know. Well, you have three dogs. You have Iggy, you have Fonzie, and you have what? Who else? Nacho. Nacho. Okay. So, as a pet owner, what do you think would be the next step um, that would help pet owners, but also preserve, you know, other people that are not pet owners? What do you think? There's anything out there that uh, hasn't been addressed yet, as far as laws or statutes? Uh, I can't think of anything right now. I, I think with a lot of things, everything has to go to your local representative so I think maybe that's the next step you have to do is to bring that in so it goes to the house or senate and they could bring that up you know mm-hmm. all righty well as a pet owner I appreciate you uh, sharing your opinion yeah. anything you want to tell our audience about pets and what, what do you think's out there uh <laughs> you know pets are our family so yeah, you have to point. yeah so you have to treat them with love you have to give them all the attention that you would give a normal family member. So that's why I'm here at the dog park. My wife, Michelle, hi. Uh, she's on a trip right now. So I am doggy daddy. You're doggy daddy and you're actually the one giving the interview. You said normally it would have been her, right? Yeah, she's here more than I am. So, um, yeah. Well, I think you bring out a really good point And I think people forget that is if they're not pet owners, they really don't realize the significance of a pet, be it a cat, a canary, you know, whatever that this is a part of the family and, you know, and it's a big loss, you know, when that pet does pass on. Sure. Um, do you think there should be a little more awareness and a little more understanding, particularly in Hawaii where there is a, a feeling of aloha? You know, I think nowadays pet owners are very mindful of how you treat your pet. Like I said, it's like a family room. It's like a child. So you have to give them the love, the attention, the care. The that, discipline? The discipline. I'm not too good at that. So. <laughs> <laughs> An indulgent parent, are you? <laughs> no, no, no. I just, I let them, you know, before you got here, they were like barking and I had to, you know, pull them, rein them in. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, hey, I want to say thank you very much for appearing on What's On, what's on Your Mind Hawaii. All right. I'm Tim Apicella for Think Tech Hawaii. For what's On Your Mind Hawaii. Aloha. All right, well, that's our show for this week. I want to encourage you to call into Think Tech Hawaii if you feel like you want to be on the show, and I'd be happy to interview you. Our next show is on July 31st, and we'll see you then. Aloha.